Okay there, so we are recording. Um, please be advised that this will be going on the Ocean County Historical Society's YouTube channel. So if anyone wants to turn their camera off or anything, please feel free to do that. And with that, oh, let me admit some more guests from the waiting room. There we go. Okay, so with that, welcome to the Ocean County Historical Society's now virtual monthly lecture series. My name is Melissa Ziobro. I am a trustee of the Historical Society, and I am temporarily emceeing these events on behalf of our hardworking president, Brian Bavasso. Uh, huge thanks to Brian and to our programs committee for making today's event happen. So thank you to Barbara Roish and uh, Mickey and Richard Kuntz, and a round of virtual applause for them. <laughs> I am joined today by our speaker, actually a return speaker for us, Mr. William Hunnicky. Mr. Hunnicky is a local attorney who also has a passionate love of history and an avid collector of history to match, to include political memorabilia. We're just coming out of an election cycle where people were showing their support with lawn signs and pins and bumper stickers and hats. And Mr. Hunnicky is going to talk to us about how people show their political support for candidates for generations and generations past. So with that, uh, take it away, Mr. Hunnicky. Thank you. Uh, let's see, am I coming up here? Go ahead. All right, am I up on screen? Not just yet. Not just yet, okay. And we just practiced this too, five <laughs> minutes ago. <laughs> did you hit the share? Uh, I did not yet, okay. Oh. All right, maybe I should just, all right. <clears throat> I'll get right into this part of it then. There we go, perfect. I can see. Okay. Just come up the screen for me. There we go. Okay. Perfect. So people ask, um, how did I get into this? Uh, my parents had a flea marketing business when I was a kid, and I started picking up some pins to pin on a straw hat that I wore to uh, keep cool outside. And I started picking up more and more political pins since I was fascinated with politics more and more. This was in the mid 60s. And it kind of grew from there. So um, it went to a collection from the hat to now about, oh, I, I've well lost count, probably six, 7,000 pieces of, of memorabilia. So we're gonna show some of it and talk about how politics has changed through the years and so forth. So um, assuming you can all see this, and I understand that Normally when I did this as a, as a live presentation, we would have feedback and people could yell out the answers, but you can just sort of think about it. So the question is easy, true or false? On election day, um, and I had done this before, uh, if, if we all felt it couldn't get here soon enough, but you cast your vote for the presidential and vice presidential candidates of whichever party you choose, true or false? And the answer is false. Actually, you cast your vote for the presidential electors who became members of the Electoral College. No one actually votes for president on election day. So on December 14th, uh, they will hopefully assemble in each of the 50 state capitals. Um, it's something that's actually open to the public. Um, if this year is gonna be a little questionable whether you can attend, but it's held in the state house then in Trenton. I've attended the last four of them as a spectator. And it's really neat to go and, and see democracy in action and, and uh, see the Electoral College working. So presumably everything will go smoothly. Uh, to be elected, of course, you need 50% plus one of the electoral votes, which is currently 270. Um, as we've been seeing with the litigation going on, each state determines how its electors are selected. Um, presidential elections are not really governed by federal law. 48 states are winner take all. Maine and Nebraska, as you probably saw in the coverage, have a portion by district and, and uh, congressional district. And Nebraska, in fact, has a split this year. Uh, if no candidate gets a majority, the election is decided in the House of Representatives in a very strange system that we don't need to go through, but that actually happened back in 1877. So, 
political memorabilia and so forth is kind of like selling cereal, um, whether it's saying, I like Ike, Wheaties, the breakfast of champions, Tip a Canoe and Tyler too, or Coca-Cola, it's the real thing. We're talking about image and image is very important to politicians and products. Um, sometimes it's really about content and you talk about the issues, whether there's uh, good ingredients in a cereal or good ingredients in a candidate, but a lot of times it's really about image. And the question is, why do we wear shirts with logos? We, we like to uh, either show an image that we like to wear uh, IZOD shirts or uh, that we've been to a certain place and we want to brag that we were in Aruba, or whatever. And also, why do we wear campaign buttons? So going back to the days of George Washington, who was unanimously elected and reelected, in those days, there was very little popular voting, in fact, basically none. Um, the Electoral College was set up because of a feeling that the majority of the people in those days were illiterate, um, didn't really have a, a grasp on voting. So the most that they let them vote for would be their state legislatures. And the feeling was that the wise people who then got elected into state legislatures would be the people who selected the electors. So there was no need for popular campaigning because there just wasn't a popular election. So the first political items you see basically uh, were some commemorative buttons to commemorate Washington's inauguration. Um, but he also had developed a uh, quite an image. Um, he was a war hero. He very carefully cultivated his image as a military leader, a gentleman statesman. He became kind of almost mythical. And um, he was ambitious, but he was also modest and, and kind of cloaked it. These are some examples of some of the uh, commemorative uh, they're, they're brass buttons. They're about the size of a uh, half dollar or so, a little bit larger. And they were minted. There's about 25 varieties of them. They're very scarce, very desirable. And um, they were pretty much the only kind of items that exist from Washington's day. So he was, again, seen as a hero, very perfect character. Um, he left his plow. He went and saved the Republic. Then he returned as a simple farmer, was brought back to be president. Uh, by living with the troops up in Valley Forge in Morristown. He was uh, kind of gave him the common touch and shared hardships. Um, and we all heard the tales after his presidency about uh, the chopping down the cherry tree and throwing the, the uh, dollar across the Potomac and all these kind of legendary things that really were totally mythical, but uh, were part of his image. In uh, 1932, a lot of items came out to commemorate the 200th anniversary of his birth. And this is a frame of some of those items. Uh, but again, there are really no campaign items per se for him. But then as time went on, reality set in. Um, during his second term, the press really started with some withering criticism of him, calling him a tyrant, a traitor, a hypocrite, a would-be monarch, which was very bad in those days because we were still in the memory of the uh, George III in England rule. And he was kind of caught in the middle of these issues with foreign relations between England and France, came under attack a lot, and a counter image developed of him as a very pompous, dangerous monarchist. And he left office very bitter, and he warned against the rise of political parties. Now, again, in those days, the early days of the Electoral College, there were no political parties. Um, the idea was that the electors would simply select the best person in the country that they knew of, regardless of party, because there were no parties. Um, so they hoped to minimize any conflict. They emphasized talent, had the best and brightest. Um, there were no provisions for nominating candidates. There were no provisions for campaigning, no provisions for popular control or voting. And um, that's pretty much the way it was for about the first five presidencies. But then a couple of factions arose. There were the Federalists who supported a strong central government and the Anti-Federalists who were states' rights people. Still kind of common images these days. And uh, Alexander Hamilton was the leader of the Federalist Party. He had some ambitious economic programs, um, wanted to give the rich and well-born more of a permanent share in the government. Uh, Jefferson was his opponent. He was more of a states' rights person, advocated true majority rule, uh, was supportive of the French Revolution, and a partisan press emerged. There were two competing papers, the National Gazette and the Gazette of the U.S., and um, 
they got into some pretty wicked name calling and, and started the, the kind of things that we still see these days with, uh, but the newspapers were just blatantly partisan in those days. Then you get into Adams and Jefferson. Uh, now we had actual two parties that were formed. Um, Adams ended up winning the presidency by three electoral votes over Jefferson. And in the rules of those days, Jefferson became vice president, even though he was from a rival party, because it was simply most electoral votes became president, second most became vice president. They realized that wasn't going to work very well. So then congressional caucuses formally nominated Adams, Adams and Jefferson as candidates in 1800. And the Republicans in particular started pouring out printed propaganda. Um, and again, a lot of it was pretty harsh and, and very uh, nasty toward John Adams. That year, um, Jefferson and Burr famously each won 73 votes. The House had to choose which would be president and vice president. And uh, of course, Burr and Hamilton ended up with their famous duel that, that kind of cascaded out of that. And uh, Hamilton ended up getting killed. So from Adams, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, electors were still chosen by the legislatures, no popular campaigns, so we don't find any campaign items for those days. Um, about the only thing that they did was they made some household items, uh, pottery and things like that, that you would put with the uh, president's image on it. But the English tradition was that you were not supposed to campaign for office. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? Um, uh, John Quincy Adams literally spent the entire election of 1824 tending to his crops and raising a barn. How things have changed. Uh, Madison and Monroe each served two terms. Um, there were very few contests, virtual unanimous re-election of each. Again, ordinary voters were playing little or no role. Candidates kept silent, made no speeches, um, really tried to, to seem like they were not seeking office. But that was up through 1820. But then there were four candidates in 1824. John Quincy Adams, Henry Clay, William Crawford, and Andrew Jackson. Now, popular voting had started to begin more and more uh, among, of course, adult white males. So ladies, you were out of the, the, uh, the picture then. You know, it was only white men who could vote. But more and more, uh, they were allowing more uh, adult white males to vote. Um, new states were being added to the union, so that expanded the electorate. Uh, six states still chose their electors through their state legislature, but the other states were allowing popular voting for the electors. But there were no grassroots activity. There was still no real popular campaigning, so no campaign items exist from 1824. Uh, that year, Jackson got the most popular votes, but did not have a majority in the Electoral College. The House ended up choosing John Quincy Adams, and uh, Jackson was livid, claiming it was a corrupt bargain. So he spent the next four years basically sabotaging Adams' presidency and plotting his revenge. And that, he felt, would require some pretty nasty political warfare and items to start grabbing the attention of voters. So this is one thing. This was a broadside that was created that uh, talks about the bloody deeds of General Jackson. This was uh, something that was made in retaliation, but uh, claiming that a lot of people were unduly and unjustly killed during the time of his uh, service as a general. Um, he had monumental temper tantrums uh, from having lost. So he started establishing this cult of personality um, wasn't really talking about issues as much as simply this, uh, this sort of symbol of that he was the hero of New Orleans. Um, he was a symbol of national glory as a war hero. And they started putting out metal tokens, garment buttons, silk ribbons, thread boxes, things that would be used around the house, often by women, interestingly, even though you couldn't vote. Um, the feeling was that by having these things in the house, the uh, wife in the house had some control over how her husband would vote. So they, they did things that were uh, directed toward people that weren't even voters. Um, he created this image of old Hickory that in the War of 1812, he had given up his horse to a wounded soldier and walked on foot with a Hickory stick, uh, even though he was a general. And that was symbolic. That was making him a man of the people. And then uh, when he beat the British at the Battle of New Orleans, that got him some enormous popular affection. 
So the 1828 election became a pure personality campaign. If you look at the literature from there, there's virtually no mention of any issues. Nobody knows what was going on. It was just, it was the hero of New Orleans against uh, Adams, who they said was an, an effeminate monarch. He was accused of procuring virgins for the czar of Russia. Um, Jackson in return was accused of murder, uh, living in sin with his wife. She had been previously married and there was a question whether she had been properly divorced uh, by the time they got married. And she had literally died of the stress from these attacks. And that just got Jackson even more angry. Um, Adams produced very few items that year as far as popular things. Uh, Jackson much more, and it was the first use of campaign items aimed for the people, and it, and it was about image. This is an example of a, it's a metal token. They were very popular in those days. Uh, sometimes they would have a hole uh, cut in the top, and you could suspend it from your uh, lapel and wear it kind of like we wear campaign buttons these days. Uh, but again, just the nation's pride, general. Nothing about issues. We have no idea what he's running about. Um, ballots were printed sheets in those days, um, we didn't have boards of elections that produced ballots. So usually uh, they would get a local newspaper to print the ballots and they would put on the names of the candidates. And if sometimes, and sometimes they only had the names of the electors who were pledged to vote for those candidates. Voters would bring it to the polling station, drop it publicly in a ballot box. Um, and that's where you heard about ballot stuffing, because if you were clever, you could fold a couple of them together and try to stuff them in, and you could get three or four votes instead of just one. Um, 1836 election was the last kind of dull election. Uh, Martin Van Buren was the heir apparent to Andrew Jackson. There were a couple other regional candidates. Very dull campaign, almost no grassroots efforts. It was just kind of a nothing but they remembered that the objects of, of a campaign could deliver messages. So, uh, oh, and this is an example of the partisanship of newspapers back in those days. Uh, newspapers would actually print a, uh, a sample ballot for the candidates of their choosing. So this was a uh, newspaper out of New York that uh, has Van Buren and uh, his running mate and then their governor candidates. Uh, sometimes I believe people would literally cut these out and put these in the ballot box. But uh, again, newspapers were extremely partisan. Then we get to the election of 1840, which changed everything. Um, popular campaigning kicked in as never seen before. But again, it was all about image. There were virtually no issues discussed. It was just a popularity contest. The Whig party had kind of come into its ascendancy. And they had this uh, Tippecanoe and Tyler II about William Henry Harrison. And that was Tippecanoe and Tyler II was their campaign slogan. So who was Tippecanoe? It was actually an 1811 battle with the Shawnee Indians that first made Harrison nationally famous. And uh, 30 years later, they capitalized on that and created his image. It was what they called a hurrah campaign. The Whigs had just been an opposition coalition, but they were ready to go and they went big time. They had parades. They had what they called a hurrah campaign. People came out in droves and they had torchlight parades. They had these balls that they made that they rolled from town to town. Um, they, they just literally, people were sort of bursting at the seams to come out and be part of a, of a campaign. So um, the, the Whigs, again, with no discussion of issues, nominated Harrison, who was popular, a military hero, and they felt that the, the party bosses felt that he could be molded or designed for their political needs. And uh, Harrison went right along with it. So it was the image of the, uh, the hero of the Indian Wars, he was presented as this rustic log cabin dweller, even though he lived in a mansion in Ohio. He was compared to Washington that he left his farm to save the country. Uh, he was supposedly very generous to old soldiers. And you'll see some of the images coming up where uh, he had a log cabin with a latch string always open to welcome everybody in a barrel of cider for um, temperate refreshment. And these were kind of down to earth virtues that corresponded with uh, feelings for farmers and domestic virtue, again, as an alternative to Jackson's temper. Um, 
a Democratic newspaper made a comment that old Granny Harrison would really be content to just sit out his days in a log cabin with a barrel of hard cider, which would be alcoholic. And the Whig leaders just jumped on this and said, you know what, we're going to make this something positive for Harrison. So this log cabin and the barrel of hard cider became central images to his whole campaign. Um, I'll skip over this one, but um, these are some of the things that came out. The thing on the left is what's called a sulfide. It's like a, it's a small pin, it's got a pin on the back. Uh, the thing in the middle is a, a little metal box. And you'll see both of them have the image of the log cabin. Uh, the right one is a, again, another one of the tokens. Uh, these are closer up views of those. And people in 1840 really rarely saw any images of candidates. Remember, most people still did not read, read newspapers. Uh, they would go to a town square and maybe somebody would have a newspaper and would read the news to them, but they didn't really see candidates. Um, certainly was no TV or anything like that. So Harrison's image makers put his picture on everything that they could possibly put it on. And um, oh, another quick trivia question there. Who was the first president born a citizen of the United States? And it was, remember Tippecanoe and Tyler too. John Tyler, who succeeded Harrison after one month, um, was actually the first person born a true citizen of the United States. All the uh, predecessors were technically British subjects when they were born. But uh, anyway, the, the election of 1840 just, just spurned this, this outpouring of images and the, the, uh, the sense that imagery could be successful. Next few campaigns were kind of on the dull side, even though 1840 was a uh, this very successful campaign for no known reason by 1844, they kind of lost their their interest in, in popular campaigning and went back to a series of extremely dull campaigns. The Whig Party faded in 1856. The Republican Party came along. Uh, John Fremont was the first candidate. Um, this is a, an envelope on the left. They, they started making patriotic envelopes that would just be sent in the mail. And again, on the right is an example of a ballot that was pr printed. And you'll see that although it mentions Fremont and Dayton, uh, there's a list of the electors underneath because you were really voting for the electors. Okay, next question. Which candidate won the presidency with only 39% of the popular vote and still won the electoral college by a virtual landslide? Abraham Lincoln. There were four major candidates in 1860 because of the, the uh, tensions going on with uh, slavery and possible secession. So you had Lincoln, Stephen Douglas, a Southern Democrat, John Breckinridge, and John Bell of the Constitutional Union Party. Lincoln only got 39% of the popular vote, but he won where it counted, three big states, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and New York. Sounds familiar, right? Which gave him 85 of the 180 electoral votes in those days that were necessary for the win. Uh, Douglas finished second in a lot of states, but he only won Missouri and three of New Jersey's votes, which were split that year. So he ended up fourth in the, in the Electoral College, even though he was the, uh, the Democratic candidate. And uh, Brickenridge, who was the vice president under Buchanan at age 36, um, was the youngest ever vice president, lost for election in 1860, and then he went to become the Secretary of War of the Confederate States. So he had the, an interesting history. Uh, Lincoln, there were a lot of really just beautiful pieces and, and so many people revere Lincoln that a lot of these have survived through the years. This is called a ferrotype. It's actually a form of a photograph that's put in a brass shell. Um, again, usually suspended by a ribbon or something like that. Um, there were metal tokens that were put out. Uh, sometimes there were matching ferrotypes for the different candidates. Um, there were a lot of issues with the impending civil war, but Lincoln still relied a lot on imagery. Uh, the fact that he was born in a log cabin. Um, this one is uh, Lincoln and Union, just talking about that he was, of course, pro keeping the Union together. Uh, another campaign envelope from uh, showing a, a beardless Lincoln and his first running mate, a uh, guy named Hannibal Hamlin, who's sort of lost to history. 
Again, the Honorable Abraham Lincoln beardless picture, um, you know, doesn't tell you anything about him, but forms the image. And this is the reverse of it, the rail splitter of the West. You know, nothing to do with being president, but this, this homespun image, the log cabin in the background, again, all about image. Uh, again, these ferrotypes became popular, photography was coming into vogue, and putting a real picture of a candidate on a campaign item, again, helped people to relate more to them. It wasn't just a something stamped on metal, now you could actually see a picture of your candidate. All right, uh, how many presidents have been impeached so far, and who were they? Of course, I had to update this one recently, but... Um, and this one, of course, is, is, uh, was needed to be updated, but uh, Andrew Johnson and Bill Clinton and somehow um, Nixon, of course, was never actually impeached. And then we have to add Trump to that. Um, Andrew Johnson, who was one of the ones who was impeached, um, because he succeeded to the presidency when Lincoln was assassinated, there were virtually no uh, campaign items for him. But tickets to his impeachment were uh, a very popular thing. It was like a spectator sport back in those days. And if you could score a ticket to the impeachment proceedings, um, you could go and be entertained that way. So tickets to the impeachment are uh, kind of the, the thing that you collect if you're going to add Andrew Johnson in there. All right. Three consecutive presidents were born in Ohio, were Civil War generals and Republicans. Who were they? The answer is... Ulysses Grant, Rutherford Hayes, and James Garfield. Uh, Grant served two terms. Uh, Hayes was the one who was elected in a uh, very questionable vote by the uh, House of Representatives when the Electoral College deadlocked. And uh, Garfield uh, served a very short term, was assassinated and ended up uh, dying in Long Branch, New Jersey. But uh, Ohio was a, a birthplace from, for presidents. And in fact, between 1896 and 1920, every other president was from Ohio. And that included uh, McKinley, who was then succeeded by Teddy Roosevelt, William Taft, who was succeeded by Wilson and Warren Harding. Uh, Grant was the first of, a, again, the string of the general candidates. Uh, Civil War generals had that, that wonderful image of success from the Civil War. So uh, they were, even though they had no political experience in especially in Grant's case, uh, became very popular. And again, some of the items, this is a, again, a ballot uh, showing the, the image and let us have peace. And, and uh, um, again, not telling you a whole lot about issues. All right, which Democratic candidate for president carried six states with 66 of electoral votes on election day, but yet didn't actually receive a single vote in the electoral college? And that was Grant's opponent, Horace Greeley, who we remember from the Go West Young Man fame. He actually died before the Electoral College met. So people ask, well, gee, what happens if a candidate dies after the election day? Well, this was the answer. Uh, the 66 electors said, well, there's no sense voting for a guy who's dead. So they split their votes among four other candidates since Grant already had a guaranteed landslide win. So Greeley became the only major party candidate to not receive a single electoral vote. Uh, election of 1876, Hayes and Tilden uh, went to the House of Representatives uh, in a very, uh, it's a, in a, a decision that's been debated for years ever since then, but he ended up winning the election by one single electoral vote. And again, that became kind of a spectator sport. And if you could score, one of the tickets to watch the proceedings where they were literally counting the votes and arguing over who would get what votes um, from 1877. Uh, these were very, very popular items that have lasted through the years. Okay, some local trivia. One president was born in New Jersey, but elected from New York. One president was born in Virginia, but elected from New Jersey. Who were they? Grover Cleveland was born up in, uh, Caldwell and was elected out of the Buffalo area. Wilson was from Virginia, but had moved to New Jersey to become a professor at Princeton, became governor of New Jersey. And uh, so we, we, ne we never had a pure 
New Jersey president. Who's the only vice president elected from New Jersey? And this is somebody who's near and dear to my heart, but a guy named Garrett A. Hobart, who we'll discuss a little bit more. Uh, who's the only president buried in New Jersey and the only first lady buried in New Jersey? Grover Cleveland and Francis Folsom Cleveland, who was Mrs. Grover Cleveland. Uh, they moved to the Princeton area after his presidency and both are buried in a uh, cemetery there. As we got into the 1800s, campaign items started getting more ornate. Um, the idea of parades and popular participation in, in campaigns came back into vogue. So they started making these beautiful ribbons that would be worn by the people in the parade. So you see the middle one is a marching club from South Bend, Indiana. One on the left is another marching club. Uh, and then Blaine, you can see he was the, the plumed knight was his nickname. Um, just some, some really spectacular silk ribbons that, that were made back in those days. So campaign items started getting getting a little uh, more interesting and, and uh, all right, the only president to get married in the White House. Once again, Grover Cleveland. Um, he met Frances Folsom when she was just 11 years old and uh, became uh, kind of his, her, her overseer, got increasingly fond of her. And in 1886, when he was in the White House, she was just 21. He was 27 years older. He proposed to her and they got married and America went gaga for Francis Folsom Cleveland, who they nicknamed as Frankie. Um, they had five children together. She became the first first lady to have a child while the first lady and her image just ended up on a host of things. Um, a lot of which were, you can see the one on the right is a uh, an ad for uh, sulfur bitters. In those days, the uh, first lady had utterly no control over the copyright to her image. So any company could pretty much at, at will um, put her image on things. And, and boy, they did. Um, these are just a couple examples. I've got about probably 50 things in my collection that are just Francis Folsom Cleveland items. And again, she couldn't even vote for her husband for president. But these things were uh, again, very much directed toward uh, the woman of the house who would buy things like these, these tonics and, and patent medicines and so forth, uh, sewing machines. Uh, this is uh, an early cigarette card that came in with a pack of cigarettes and had portraits of the various ladies of the White House, including Frankie. Um, there is a series of cards. This one's a comparison with Lillian Langtree, who was an actress at the time, and she was in the same series of cards that, that Francis Cleveland was. Um, the, the country just kind of went crazy for her. Um, what president's daughter was supposedly the inspiration for the candy bar, the baby Ruth? Grover Cleveland again. Um, they, they said that they named the, the candy bar, the baby Ruth, after their daughter, Ruth Cleveland. Um, although some people say it may have been a story just to avoid paying royalties to Babe Ruth, who they were really naming it after. Uh, this is a poster, uh, Mrs. Cleveland and her kids. Um, again, it was just amazing how, how the, the country took to her. 1888, um, Harrison was the grandson of William Henry Harrison, going back to that 1840 campaign. And Harrison was pretty much known to have absolutely no personality. He was just this gruff, dour guy. So they went back to 1840 and they adopted the log cabin imagery again. Um, vendors were now making things for sale to the candidates. These are little mechanical things. It looks like a chair. And when you close it, it says the chair to the White House. And when you pop it open, it has a picture of either Cleveland or Harrison, depending which one you decided to buy. Um, tokens were still in use, but now we were getting into some more e elaborate enamel pins and stuff. Um, some of the, the items get a lot prettier. Uh, again, the Victorian era, where if you've ever been in a Victorian house, you know the, the furnishings were very ornate and very heavy. Um, campaign items became kind of the same way, and um, they became more and more things that people would wear. They were very showy. They were getting larger. 
Uh, okay, which president lost for re-election but did come back four years later to get elected again? And the big issue that year was protective tariffs, which is something we heard about recently. And once again, of course, you probably mostly remember this, it was Grover Cleveland. And this is just a, another example of a household item. Uh, for example, uh, for president, Grover Cleveland and his running mate at that time, who was Adlai Stevenson, who was the grandfather of the Adlai Stevenson who ran against Eisenhower back in the 50s. Um, but just the, the fact that you would have a piece of household China. I mean, how many of us nowadays would have a piece of household China with a picture of a president and vice president that we would put up prominently? You know, maybe a few, but not many. But in those days, um, people decorated their houses with imagery like this. And again, if the lady of the house got that plate and put it up, it was definitely a message. If she had up a Grover Cleveland plate, she didn't want her husband voting for whoever was running against him. Um, the silk industry, which was, uh, of course, very big up in Patterson, New Jersey, produced some just beautiful ribbons and things. Um, I'm not sure if you can see behind me. I've got, uh, I'll try to hold it up later if I can, but um, they, they just did these beautiful, large handkerchiefs and bandanas and things that you could either hang up or I'm not sure exactly what people did with them, but uh, just some, some beautiful imagery. Parades again became popular. So you started getting hats and inside the hats would be pictures of the candidates. All right, another trivia question. What Democrat lost three times and who were the two presidents to defeat him? Answer, William Jennings Bryan. He lost to McKinley twice in 1896 and 1900, took a couple years off and then he ran again in 1908 and he lost to William Howard Taft. All right, I mentioned Garrett Hobart before. These are a couple posters with McKinley and Hobart. Before I get into him, we get to 1896 and a woman named Amanda Lugy developed and patented a new form of a pin back button. And it's basically the button as we know it now. It's, it's a metal shell, a piece of paper that would be printed. It would be laid over that and celluloid would be laid over it, and then you put a pin in the back. Seems simple, but nobody had thought of it until 1894. A firm out of Newark, New Jersey called Whitehead and Hogue bought her patent and decided we could use this for campaign buttons. And that changed the whole material culture of campaign items. Um, they didn't have to do metal tokens anymore. They didn't have to do a lot of these more elaborate things. These were mass produced. They could make for a penny or so perfect for popular campaigns. So you just started seeing now the era of just these beautiful graphics. Um, the one on the left, Brian, uh, one of the issues that year was the gold standard versus free silver. And you see a lot of his things with a silver motif. A lot of the McKinley items are just patriotic red, white, and blue. Uh, this is one of my frames just showing some of the variety of the type of buttons and things that were starting to be produced then. Um, the, the fact that you could now have these mass produced buttons with just essentially a piece of paper printed and put over a button just changed what, what people were able to, to wear and use. Um, this is another frame with a kind of a mix of things. Um, and some of these parade ribbons that you see in 1896, McKinley did what they called a front porch campaign where he literally sat on his front porch in Canton, Ohio, and delegations came mostly by rail to meet with him there. They would get off the train station, they would go up in a little parade, they'd have this hoo-ha parade escorting everybody up there. He'd come out, he'd give a little rah-rah speech, and the people would go back all riled up to go back and campaign for him back home. And the one I love on the right uh, where it says New Jersey Sound Money Delegation. That was the on October 30th, I think it is, uh, that year. A group from New Jersey went out there and paid their homage to William McKinley. But I love it that the image that they chose to represent New Jersey was a gigantic mosquito, even back then. So 1896 became much more of an issue campaign. In fact, one of the most issue in history. McKinley who was the Republican, supported American industry and banking. <laughs> Oddly enough, one of the issues that year was the federal government had too big of a surplus. 
They were collecting so much money from tariffs that they had so much money they didn't know what to do with it. And it was actually hurting the economy because they were taking too much money out. Oh boy, how things have changed. Um, he chose Garrett Hobart, who was from New Jersey as his vice president. Um, Hobart was a former assemblyman. He had been, he was born in New Jersey, um, had his law practice up in Patterson, graduate of Rutgers University, served on the Rutgers University Board of Trustees, um, was again, a member of the uh, New Jersey Assembly, um, very highly re regarded back in those days and felt to be a, a, a very good running mate for, uh, for McKinley. So this, this idea of sound money was the heart of the campaign. So again, they just put out a lot of these things with sound money and protection, which was a, a kind of a pro-tariff message. The Bryan campaign ran on what they called the free silver campaign. Um, this was much more in favor of farmers. They were looking for a monetary standard that was backed by silver rather than gold to free up credit for farmers. So you see, again, the imagery, even though they're talking an issue, they put almost all of his items in silver. So when you looked at the items, you either saw gold or you saw silver and, and you saw um, they wanted free silver at a rate of 15 to one. So that even made, made some clever campaign items. Um, a clock on the left showing the time is 16 to one. Uh, Republicans used this image of gold bugs and uh, this was a satirical piece in response with a farmer's pitchfork spearing a bunch of the gold bugs and says how the farmer loves gold bugs. Uh, all right, I talked about the front porch campaign. Um, again, just uh, a lot of ribbons and buttons and those combinations that were for these excursions to Canton. Uh, a very, again, a lot of popular participation in the campaign that year. Uh, that New Jersey piece again, uh, the wheelmen were bicycle clubs, which were very popular back then. And they rode around on bicycles in support. This is just an example of some of the just beautiful ornate ribbons that they did. The thing up top is a uh, belt actually, uh, like a burlap belt with uh, both gold and McKinley and Hobart. Um, a lot of railroads were involved. And again, Hobart was uh, an attorney who had uh, represented a lot of railroad interests. So there was that connection. Uh, so Hobart, unfortunately, most people haven't heard of him. Uh, because he had the misfortune of dying in office in November 1899 before McKinley's term was, was finished. So uh, at that point, he pretty much faded into history. He was replaced by Teddy Roosevelt when McKinley ran for re-election. And when McKinley got assassinated, uh, Garrett Hobart faded into obscurity. But um, I've got about 300 Hobart pieces in my collection. I, I just since he and I both went to Rutgers, both served on the Rutgers Board of Trustees, or both attorneys, and I grew up in Clifton, which is right next to Patterson, so I, I feel like I, I'm a kindred spirit with Hobart, so uh, uh, I've, that's one of the focuses of my, my collections. And it's just fun mentioning him because 99% of, of everybody on the planet has never heard of Garrett Hobart because he just truly, truly faded in the history. Um, but some of the items that were produced were just amazing in their beauty. Uh, I guess this is again, it's a little mechanical piece. When you close it, it's just a flag being held by a hand and then you clip the, the little uh, latch on it and it pops open and you see the images of McKinley and Hobart. Just, you know, some beautiful pieces. Um, this was from his funeral services up in Patterson, unfortunately. Um, Again, he was very highly regarded um, when, when he when he passed away, it was like a national tragedy and it was front page coverage on, uh, I mean, this is a British newspaper even. So um, McKinley ran for reelection in 1800. It was a very prosperous time. So the imagery was a full dinner pail. Uh, workmen going to work with a full dinner pail and they actually made dinner pails with said the full dinner pail in support, uh, imagery also on buttons. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, again, became the running mate. And 
it was interesting because he was so popular from his days with the Rough Riders in the Spanish American War that he became an image unto himself. And um, there were some items that, that feature him almost more so than, than um, McKinley. Of course, he ran for his own term after succeeding. And these are some of the buttons that began being produced. Um, again, as Whitehead and Hogue got the got underway with, with producing some just beautiful graphics. I mean, it, it just leads to a series of campaign buttons that people avidly wore that, that um, are, are just amazing with the imagery. Um, the use of Lady Liberty, um, just great graphics, great colors, um, and people actually wore buttons in those days. Okay, uh, who is the only president to also serve as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court? That was William Howard Taft. And as president, he appointed six justices, including another chief justice, and then uh, went on to become chief justice himself. He actually was more interested in being a judge than president. And he, he always said he was happier being uh, chief justice than he ever was as president. Who was defeated for election as vice president, but later became chief justice? Got to jump forward a few years, but Earl Warren, he was a former governor of California, ran with Dewey for vice president in 1948, tried to get the nomination in 52, but Nixon delivered the California votes to Eisenhower so that he would be named vice president. Eisenhower promised Warren that he'd appoint him to the next Supreme Court vacancy, ended up the chief justice died, and Warren was appointed chief justice with absolutely no prior judicial experience whatsoever. So when you hear now arguments about Supreme Court justices and so forth, and keep in mind that Earl Warren went on to become a pretty decent chief justice with no judicial experience whatsoever. Which president named the most Supreme Court justices? George Washington. He got to name the entire first Supreme Court, so he named 11 in total. FDR was in office 13 years, but only named nine justices in that time. Uh, he tried to pack the court, which we've heard discussions about recently, but that was soundly defeated. Um, William Henry Harrison, Zachary Taylor, Andrew Johnson, and Jimmy Carter appointed absolutely zero Supreme Court justices in their days. All right, Taft, who we just talked about, ultimately went on to become Chief Justice. He was Teddy Roosevelt's handpicked successor, ran against Bryan. This is an example of kind of matching buttons that vendors put out in those days. So you could just pick which one you wanted. And they were sold in stores or street corners or wherever, mostly in stores. Items still very ornate. Um, an example up the top of three different candidates. You got Roosevelt, Alton Parker from 1904, and then Taft from 1908. And it's basically the exact same button with just the three different uh, sets of candidates on it. Watch fobs were very much in vogue uh, when, mayor, when men wore three-piece suits. So for the elections of 1908, 1912, 16, and 20, campaign fobs were very popular. But when that style faded out, so did that. So it's an example of material culture that kind of came and went in a very short span. And these are some examples of watch fobs. So sometimes campaign items just tell you what's going on in society and literally how people dress and what accessories that they would use with them. All right, which incumbent president lost his bid for re-election so badly that he actually finished third in the electoral college. And that gets us back to poor old Taft. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt had picked Taft as his successor, but was very unhappy with the way his presidency went. So Roosevelt chose to run for a third term with the progressive or what's called the Bull Moose Party. Um, he and Taft split the Republican votes, which then gave Wilson the presidency. Uh, Roosevelt finished second in the Electoral College and Taft finished a distant third, becoming the only major party, uh, especially incumbent, to not only lose, but to finish third. And to add insult to injury, his running mate, James Sherman, uh, died before the election. So between the two of them, uh, not only did they finish third, but uh, the, the vice, president, vice presidential candidate didn't even live till uh, the meeting of the Electoral College. Wilson, um, again, the New Jersey colors of blue and buff, as we call it. Uh, part of the imagery of him running for president was his New Jersey background there. A candidate resigned from the Supreme Court to run for president and lose, but then later was appointed chief justice. 
And that was Charles Evans Hughes. He was governor of New York. Then in 1910, he was appointed associate justice of the Supreme Court by Taft. When Taft lost for re-election in 1912, Hughes ran in 1916 um, and ended up winning the Republican nomination with winning only three primaries. And he actually ran as a sitting justice. Once he got the nomination, he resigned from the Supreme Court to run against Wilson and lost. Decided not to run again in 1920 because his daughter had passed away, but Harding appointed him Secretary of State. He served under Harding and Coolidge. And then Harding appointed Taft as Chief Justice. And when Taft retired, Hughes was appointed to replace Taft as Chief Justice. So some real interesting interconnections among all of them, but Hughes had a very interesting history. Even though he lost for the presidency, um, he served as Chief Justice for many years, Secretary of State, Governor of New York, uh, prior, prior Associate Justice. It's a history that you don't kind of see anymore these days. Uh, Wilson, um, America first being a, a theme back then. This was when the uh, First World War was, was impending and there was the sense of, well, we don't want to necessarily get involved in foreign wars. All right, which two presidents ran on a national ticket for either president or vice president five times and which had the best win-loss record? FDR. He ran four times for president, but a lot of people forget that he ran for vice president in 1920 with James Cox. Uh, they lost in an absolute landslide to Harding. Uh, and then Nixon ran for vice president twice, successfully, lost for president in 1960, and then successfully ran for president two more times. So each one of them had four wins and one loss, although FDR at least his four wins were as president. Uh, buttons became a little easier to, to produce when a form of lithography, which is literally you take the, the metal, you put a, a uh, lithograph, uh, kind of like, it's almost like painting it onto the metal. They're not as beautiful as the celluloid pins, but they're very cheap, very cost efficient. And they came into vogue in the uh, pretty much the 1920 era. Uh, Davis was the 1924 candidate, uh, Cox and Roosevelt again, 1920. Uh, both Democratic candidates, years that they knew they were going to lose, and people, things are very scarce from those days. Uh, enamel pins became popular in the 1920s. Um, with the Great Depression, FDR obviously had a very clear issue-based campaign in 1932, uh, kicking out the Great Depression. <laughs> Hoover was blamed for doing nothing, uh, putting out a, a, a button that says, Speed Recovery Reelect Hoover, Probably not the most brilliant button in history, but uh, they gave it a shot. And the Women's Christian Temperance Union, uh, which was a uh, prohibition group, said vote for Hoover. And at that point, the country was so tired of prohibition that they were ready to vote for FDR. And uh, FDR just generated just a, a mountain of buttons between the fact that he ran four different times and he was just such a popular person. Um, the the amount of Roosevelt buttons is just almost beyond belief. All right, we'll go with the biggest loser. Who received the least electoral votes of any major candidate? And we won't count um, Horace Greeley, who of course had died. And that was Alf Landon in 1936. He only won eight electoral votes. FDR got 98.5% of the electoral college. Um, Mondale only got 13 in 1984 and McGovern got 17 in 1972. Those were big time landslides. Getting back to imagery, Alf Landon, who ran in 1936 against FDR, was the governor of, of um, Kansas. Sunflower is their state symbol and they just went crazy using the sunflower symbol. Again, it didn't work too well since he lost in a landslide, but just uh, produced a lot of beautiful buttons. They still went with the red, white, and blue theme for a few things just to play it safe, but um, probably 95% of land and buttons are, are uh, that. And again, button vendors still, you could go to the local store and buy the button of your candidate and pin it on, and they had matched pairs and you picked which one you wanted. 100 years after 1840, 
Then we get to FDR against Wendell Wilkie. It is just like one of the most great elections from the viewpoint of uh, popular participation and um, the, the buttons and things that were produced. Wilkie came out of nowhere. Um, uh, Thomas Dewey, Arthur Vandenberg, a couple other, uh, Robert Taft were the, the favorites to get the nomination. Wilkie just came out of nowhere with this popular uh, campaign that, that was done on his behalf, uh, ended up with the Republican nomination, and it produced this unbelievable array of slogan buttons and things. This is a frame of uh, just some of the better Wilkie pins that I have. And you just see a crazy variety. Um, it's a little out of focus, but if you look at the bottom right, the, uh, the one with the elephant shows him for better way of putting it, passing gas and blowing a little donkey out. And it says gone with the wind uh, with that uh, movie having been released in 1939, just a year before. Um, people get pretty clever with some of these things. Um, this was just an example of one issue that came up. Franklin Roosevelt's son had been appointed as a captain in the army, uh, bypassing the normal, you know, private sergeant, whatever. He went right up to captain. And uh, they put out a series of buttons basically saying, hey, I want to be a captain too, or my son is not a captain. And these were buttons that, from what we understand, were mostly sold by vendors who would stand outside of bus stations or street corners and so forth. And, and for five cents or so in 1940, which is the tail end of the depression, you could buy these buttons. Um, there's probably, I've got three frames just on, on this particular issue. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was a very controversial first lady, ended up with a series of buttons against her uh, that's never been seen before any other election. No, no other first lady has engendered the kind of kind of hatred that she did. Um, but you know, just basically as simple as we don't want Eleanor either, or um, the one in the middle to the right says "My Day." That was the name of a newspaper column that uh, Eleanor did, and so they picked up on that and said, "Well, it's my day when I vote for Wilkie." Um, never, never before or after seen that kind of. Uh, hatred toward a first lady. Uh, Wilkie pins, there, there's one button that says 100 million buttons can't be wrong, which they were, but um, I have in my collection, I lost count, but over 1,200 different Wilkie buttons. That's how much was produced that year. Um, this is a salesman sample card uh, from a button company that just showed the kind of buttons that could be ordered from them. Um, Frank, Franklin Roosevelt famously did his fireside chats. So these were even buttons that just said as simple as no more fireside chats. Uh, and he would always start out the fireside chats by saying my friends. So they just put out buttons that said my friends, goodbye, uh, making fun of his accent with the my friends, um, my friends, but not my subjects. There was, uh, complaints that he was becoming more like royalty than, than a president. Um, so a lot of things that they just picked up on the theme there. Uh, Joe Lewis, who was very popular, um, ended up with, uh, ended up supporting Wilkie and a number of buttons were put out. Um, again, uh, any sort of appeals to black candidates or black voters in those days was very rare. So the fact that uh, Wilkie was outspokenly in favor of civil rights as a Republican candidate and was backed by Wilkie. Um, unusual to see buttons like that. Um, there's pretty much nothing like it in any other campaign. Uh, a lot of Democrats were put off by the fact that Roosevelt was running for a third term. So there are a lot of Democrats for Wilkie. Um, the thing in the middle is a license plate attachment. If you picture an old car, like an old Model A or something that had the kind of standalone license plate, you could just fix that on the top of it. And they were extremely popular back in the 40s. The no third term theme. Um, again, this is one of about five frames I have of just no third term items. And some of them were um, just basically simply no third term. Uh, some of them got a little risque. If you look in the bottom left, um, no man is good three times. Confucius say, man who stand up twice, no good three times. 
Uh, two times is enough for any man. Uh, you know, some some fun little double entendres that they had some some fun with in 1940. Some close-ups of those. Uh, no third termites. Uh, Uncle Sam with the thumbs down. Two good terms deserve a rest. Uh, baseball references forced Franklin out at third. Uh, they just they had a lot of fun with the uh, and then uh, there were a lot of people smoked in those days so you could get um, campaign cigars. These are boxes of the campaign cigars. Matches were very popular since everybody smoked in those days so you could get campaign matches. Um, the one on the, uh, the sort of toward the right with the, the we the people want Wilkie, each match is an individual voter on there. And the image of Wilkie up at the top is actually a little 3D image that comes out. I mean, just really elaborate stuff that they made. Hats were very popular that year. You could walk around with a Wilkie for president hat. Uh, again, uh, more variety of the license plate attachments. It was a, it was a, a year unlike any other with the popular imagery and uh, there were a lot of, there was a lot of sheet music. There's probably about 20 different Wilkie songs that were made. Um, this is literally chewing gum, uh, jewelry pins for women who wanted to wear something a little fancier than just a button, uh, silk handkerchiefs, we want Wilkie, uh, ties for the men, uh, again, a reference to the Gone with the Wind from the year before, a little cleaner than the one with the button with the, with the elephant on it. So it was just a, it was a, a really neat year, something that would have been a lot of fun. I don't know if anybody's old enough that they were uh, kids back then and remember it, but, um, you know, it, it must have been just a really fascinating year where people wore these buttons and so forth, probably like any, uh, un unlike any other year. All right, two candidates, one Republican, one Democrat, lost four successive elections. Who were they? That was Thomas Dewey, lost to FDR and Truman, and then Adlai Stevenson, lost twice to Dwight Eisenhower. And Dewey, of course, tried getting the nomination in uh, 1940 as well, so he was, in a way, almost a three-time loser. Uh, Truman, what did the S and Harry S. Truman stand for? Nothing. It was just S. He adopted it to honor his grandfathers, Anderson Ship Truman and Solomon Young. Uh, in fact, there's generally no period used after it. Then uh, I like Ike, one of the simplest and greatest slogans ever. Now, people knew he was a war hero, but as far as what issues he was running on, who cared? It was just all a personality-based campaign. And they used this I like Ike imagery on buttons, hats. Um, Stevenson was famously at a campaign event and a photographer got a picture of him with his legs crossed and a hole in the bottom of his shoe. And they thought that that was um, just something that uh, said something negative about Stevenson. So the Eisenhower people put out these buttons that said, don't let this happen to you. And the uh, there was a lot of jewelry, um, much more appeals to women uh, in, in the 50s for some reason. Suburban housewives apparently were now being seen as a critical voting block. And there's just a, a ton of jewelry items, earrings, pins, bracelets, uh, just any number of things. TV was coming into vogue. Um, so for the first time, you started seeing things with references to television. Um, this Dollars for Democrats campaign to keep them on TV and this victory committee uh, were things that we're now seeing a shift in campaigning from regular kind of street corner campaigning to, okay, now TV is becoming important. So then that brought us to 1960 with the first televised TV de debates. And that began really a major change in campaigning and campaign items because now money was going to TV and mass media and you didn't need buttons and small items uh, that much more. Uh, still a lot of items, especially directed toward women, a lot of jewelry items in the, the 50s and 60s. Uh, Nixon tried softening his image by using a lot of imagery uh, featuring Pat Nixon, first time really of that magnitude. Um, 
and try to emphasize experience over Kennedy. Um, Kennedy, one of the things that they did, they had these coffee with Kennedy meetings. And the idea was you would have a meeting at your house, watch something on TV. They had these, these uh, TV shows that were programmed and you would have coffee with Kennedy and the hostess would serve coffee and you'd watch the TV thing. And uh, it would get, again, mostly suburban housewives together to enjoy coffee with the Kennedy family. Uh, an example of Nixon trying to soften his image a little bit by using pat items um, other than the Francis Cleveland items from way back when, and they were more just reacting to the fact that she was so popular, and the anti-Eleanor Roosevelt. It's the first time you really saw a potential first lady being featured a lot on items. Again, trying to appeal to women who were more and more an, an important voting bloc. Emphasizing experience over Kennedy's lack of it. This is just one item from the collection um, uh, from when Kennedy was assassinated. There's not a whole lot of things from that day, but there are three versions of the uh, reception that was held at the airport where he landed just before he went downtown in the motorcade. And this is an item from my collection from uh, the, the reception that day. They're, they're pretty scarce and hard to find. All right, so 1964, Obviously, no way Lyndon Johnson was going to lose. Goldwater got um, nominated, um, even though he was extremely conservative. And I think even he understood that there was no way he was going to win. But yet, they cranked out campaign items that year big time. There are over a thousand different buttons, 200 different bumper stickers, jewelry, pennants, pens, pencils, and the de debut of T-shirts even. Um, and again, going with just some very simple imagery, uh, nice rhyming LBJ for the USA, red, white, and blue, great slogan, hard to beat, all the way with LBJ. Simple, doesn't really tell you anything about issues, but good slogan. Um, let us continue with him superimposed over Kennedy, um, you know, powerful imagery, the kind of stuff that, that uh, you know, was, was definitely gonna succeed. Um, this is just an example of some local things. Uh, Henry Helstosky was a candidate up in North Jersey for, for Congress, and they mailed out uh, records, and you could just take out the record and listen to the record, and there was a little plea from Lyndon Johnson for uh, Henry Helstosky. You don't see that kind of stuff anymore. That was the inside of it. Um, you could just literally put it on your record player and play it and listen to it. Goldwater, um, if you notice the the four with the arrow pointing to the right, uh, all the symbolism of him being a right-wing candidate. In your heart, you know, he's right. Um, they made no bones about his conservatism. And then they also used the gold theme. I mean, if he's got a name like Goldwater, you might as well put out pins and gold. So very heavy use of the imagery there, literally down to cans of gold water, the right drink for the conservative taste. Um, his glasses were the subject of a lot of items. Again, not telling you anything about issues, but having fun with the fact that he wore these, these big black glasses. Uh, again, a lot of the jewelry items still being produced. Still a lot of appeals to women with that. 1968, Johnson withdrew. You had McCarthy, Robert Kennedy, Humphrey battling for the nomination. Uh, George Wallace ran as a third party candidate and actually got 46 electoral votes. Uh, Nixon pretty much won in a landslide, and they had a lot of money, put it a lot, uh, a lot of it into campaign items. But again, more and more money now going to TV. And from the viewpoint of collectors, the campaigns really at this point stopped producing a lot of buttons or anything. And the hobby was becoming more popular, and a lot of collectors started making buttons to sell to other collectors, which we have a lot of ethical questions about. Um, but you had McCarthy kind of going with the flower power theme. Um, he was, you know, obviously somebody who appealed a lot to college students and so forth. So um, you see a lot of, of that imagery in there. Uh, Robert Kennedy was just, you know, again, the potential successor to JFK's legacy. Um, and some of the pins reflect that. Uh, the Wallace items, which were mostly collector produced, really, but um, he had a lot of a lot of stuff that was put out. Uh, Nixon items, 
the the one on the for the bottom left, yes, Nixon, no jelly. No jelly was a um, a candy. It was like a peanut butter bar with no jelly. And for whatever reason, they picked up on that and they they put out buttons that produced uh, yes, Nixon with the, the no jelly. Odd item. All right, the only president vice president ticket in which both failed to finish out their four year terms, of course, was Nixon and Agnew. Both resigned before the end of uh, the four year term that they were elected to in 1972. Uh, some items, the, these are a lot of these are more the, the few last legitimate items that the pan campaign put out, again, with the red, white, and blue themes. Carter, again, great use of imagery. Remember, he came from his farmer background. And he was kind of careful not to attack Ford on Watergate because Ford was seen as a decent guy. So they went more with the imagery of, um, but at the only time in history, instead of red, white, and blue buttons, you primarily saw green and white buttons, uh, emphasizing the, the farm thing. Uh, the thing in the lower center is actually a little bag of peanuts, Jimmy Carter for President Peanuts from his peanut farm. Um, so since then, TV has mostly taken over with the internet as the main form of campaigning. Buttons and bumper stickers, other items, they're just not cost effective. Now mostly made by vendors to sell at rallies or to other collectors. Um, you'll see stickers a lot because that's much cheaper than a pin for a one day event. And the question, do people wear buttons like they used to? I mean, how many times this campaign did you see somebody walking around wearing a campaign button? Probably almost never. Um, T-shirts and hats are now our for favorite form of expression. I just put a couple examples of uh, what, what people did, not only the MAGA hats, but uh, then there were the variations. So, uh, you know, no matter what somebody puts out, somebody comes out with a, an answer to it. But, you know, we have mostly gone to, to hats and T-shirts and so forth. So, all right, we're almost wrapping up. So a few less trivia questions. What is the first, the most common first name among presidents, among six of them? It is James, Madison, Monroe, Polk, Buchanan, Garfield, and Carter. What first name was shared by four presidents? William, William Henry Harrison, Taft, McKinley, and Clinton. What two first names were shared by three presidents? John, and then what two names were shared by only two presidents? And that's tricky. It's actually Franklin, which is Franklin Pierce and Franklin Roosevelt, and Thomas, uh, Thomas Jefferson, and Woodrow Wilson's first name was actually Thomas. So he was Thomas Woodrow Wilson, but dropped in the use of the name Thomas. And then the very last question, final jeopardy. What president's actual first name was Stephen? If you were paying attention to a lot of the answers, Grover Cleveland, S. Grover Cleveland was Stephen Grover Cleveland. So again, thank you for playing. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, I know we weren't able to really do a, a question and answer. So I just put in here that if you have any questions, anything you'd like to discuss, if you have a question about some button that grandma left you, wondering if it's anything good, feel free to contact me. You can email me. You can phone. Um, glad to talk about this stuff anytime. And if conditions were better, uh, I believe me, I would have loved to have had my collections spread out and, uh, you know, for, for view, but hope you enjoyed it and learned something from this. Awesome. I will clap on behalf of everybody. Oh, I can see people clapping if we can't hear them. That was tremendous, Bill. Thank you. I'm struck by how the materials changed over time, but the methods really didn't too much, right? It, there's a lot of these emotional appeals, right. a lot of uh, focus on the character of the president, their persona, their vibe, if you will. Right. And like I said, um, it, it very it very much becomes like selling cereal where um, it's all about image, you know, tastes great, less filling, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and you're just kind of selling the candidate the same way. And you have to distill it down to sometimes something that says utterly nothing, you know, saying Tippecanoe and Tyler too tells you nothing except that he was a war hero. And sometimes that was, that was enough to elect somebody. 
So interesting. So I'm going to open it up to just a brief Q&A. And we actually have our first question here in the chat from our president, Brian. Hey, Brian. He says, what did Garrett Hobart die of? Uh, Garrett Hobart, I believe, died of essentially heart failure. Um, he was he was overweight. He was not in good shape. Um, and he just started kind of fading toward the end of his term. Um, and was he, he was he was a very active vice president. He uh, presided over the Senate. Um, they said very well. He was probably one of the most active vice presidents as far as being not an official part of the cabinet, but being very involved with McKinley. They were very close. They, they had lunch and dinner together frequently. Um, but his health just wasn't very good. And, and I believe it was ultimately heart failure. Okay. All right, anybody else have a question? You can type it in the chat and I will read it for you or you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask. Okay, well, you have Bill's info here. If you think of any questions, oh, here we go, here's one. Uh, let's see, it says, were there buttons for the few women presidential candidates? So Woodhull, Margaret Trace Smith, et cetera. Uh, Margaret Trace Smith, yes, a few. Uh, Woodhull was before 1896, so no buttons for her. There are a few extremely rare pieces that would relate to Woodhull and some of the earlier Belleville Lockwood, uh, some of the earlier candidates. They are they are really scarce and really desirable. Um, you know, for Margaret Chase Smith, for Geraldine Ferraro, for Elizabeth Dole, for people who were hopeful candidates. Um, there are buttons for them. Um, again, a lot of them were kind of more vendor produced, but um, yeah, there are a few official things. That, that, that's a, a subcategory that, that people do collect. So the archivist in me has to know, how on earth do you keep track of all of this? You're talking about thousands of pieces. Do you have your own cataloging system or? I yeah, I do. I mean, I, I've got these, you know, everything's kind of in, in frames like this. So um, I photograph them and then I set up uh, something on a flash drive. So if, if I have a chance, if I see something on eBay and I think, well, let's see, that's a, uh, a Wilkie button. I'm not sure I have it. I can go and I just have pictures of my 71 frames full of Wilkie buttons that, that I can look at and, and uh, yeah, I can pretty much figure it out. So yeah, I, I, I kind of got to the point I had to do that a few years ago. And then you know, a lot of the things you just, you just kind of remember, um, you know, some of the things are, I mean, this is a, a sheet music from 1844 for Clay and Freelinghuisen, which is of interest because Freelinghuisen, if you know the, the name from North Jersey, um, you know, as a family that's been involved in politics for a long time up there. So that's kind of a, you know, I like things with the New Jersey co connection. I also have a, a lot of New Jersey governor pins. Um, and then just, you know, some things are fun. Uh, people can see this if you remember from before you were a kid, but people, my more my contemporaries, uh, we used to get milk delivered in school. And um, there was a series that was put out, it was the, the presidential series. And it's got, uh, let's see, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson on there. And, uh, you know, like some of these things have somehow survived through the years and, uh, you know, just bring back memories. It's not really a campaign item, but, you know, definitely political related. Um, and then there were, well, I, you saw the coffee with Kennedy thing before. And this is, an, they had I like Ike cups. And for years, 7-Eleven used to put out things where you could go and you got your coffee in a, an Obama cup or a Romney cup. And then they use the results of how many cups that they sold to uh, keep track of that. So, you know, I've got cups and things like that. Um, and there's cigar. This was a cigar box from, again, my, my, my man, McKinley and Hobart. But I mean, just, you know, really beautiful graphics on some of these things. And, you know, it was a box of campaign cigars that were put out back in 1896. So, yeah, you just, you, you kind of know what you have and then you do the, the cataloging for the things otherwise. So, so fascinating. Any other questions from our audience? Okay, well, 
Before we go, I'd like to encourage everyone to visit our website, oceancountyhistory.org, to learn more about the Historical Society. You can also donate there from the convenience of your home if you are so inclined. We are now open again by appointment, and you can find more about that on our website too. You can also find the Historical Society on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. So if you enjoyed today's talk, it will be on our YouTube channel um, later on this afternoon. So on behalf of the Historical Society, again, Bill, thank you so much for sharing your collection with us. And thank you all for joining us on this Sunday. We hope to see you again soon. Bye -bye. Thank you all.